Hi, this is Pat with Racket Stringing Tips, and today our guest is Herb Bard. Is that hopefully I pronounced that right? Yeah, he's close from, Baird. Baird. yeah close enough, Baird. And he's from Texas, and he also has a uh, YouTube channel as well. And he strings at uh, a, a variety of IT, uh, ITA and um, uh, NCA tournaments in his local area. Sounds like there's a lot of college tennis and just juniors in your area. So that's great. And he's a self-taught stringer. And today I think we're just going to talk about kind of your experience, uh, a little bit about, you know, what got you into stringing, um, the kind of equipment you use. I know you've, you use some of the Wilson uh, stringing machines. And so I kind of want to hear, because, you know, I've had experience actually working with uh, the Bayardo machine when they first started, even, you know, back in 2008, 2009, you know, and um, I've never actually, I've never actually physically seen the light model. So I'd kind of like to get your take on that as well. So, you know, I guess that'll be just kind of my intro. And so, um, yeah, thanks for joining me today. Um, you know, we're kind of, uh, I think we're about four hours apart. I'm, a, I'm out in Hawaii, you know, a couple, you know, thousand miles out in the ocean and, and you're out in uh, Texas, right? Central time. Well, yeah. Yeah. I'm right in the panhandle. So how's, how's the weather? How's the weather there? Good. Or? Uh, I mean, for us, it's kind of chilly. It's like 62, 63 degrees today, but it's nice and sunny. Uh, pretty nice. Oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess, yeah, I mean, you know, tell me a little bit about uh, how did you get into uh, racket string? Well, you know, I guess it's kind of a common story. Um, we have one kid, and when she started playing tennis back 11, 12, whatever many years ago it was, uh, I, I, I guess my personality, let's start with this, my personality, whenever I get into something, I get into something. You know, I got into poker for a while. I helped design poker chips. I built poker table. I even sold a poker table, the Amarillo Slim. Oh. So I get into something. I get into it. Like my new thing is uh, scotch. So I've got a whole scotch collection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't really drink that much in that collection. But uh, so it started out when uh, she started playing tennis. You know, and we didn't really know anything. So I started studying up on rackets, studying up on strain different properties, that type of stuff. We'd take it to the, 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 where I live at, there's actually a local tennis specialty store. Who probably 80% of the market, you know, stringing, sales, everything. And uh, I would take a racket to them, and we'd get a string, get attention. A couple of weeks later, well, let's try something else. And we'd try something else. And keep paying for that over time. You know, it just started to add up. But I'd go in and watch them. And Really kind of figured I could figure it out. But what really kind of sent me over the age to make me want to do it, we finally settled for a string and a tension. And we'd go in and take two of her rackets. And this month it cost us $50. We'd take them back in three, four weeks later, it cost $75. And we'd take them back in two, three, four weeks later, it cost $30. So everybody that was checking us out was charging us a different price. So that's when I told my wife, I was like, you know what? I can buy a stupid little drop weight and figure this stuff out and not worry about them charging me something different. I was like, go in there, hey, how much is this string? Oh, it's $22. Well, online, you got it for $15. Oh, okay, it's 15 today. So I figured yeah. I'd figure it out and start stringing. Yeah, you know, I, I guess that does sound like it is a pretty typical story, right? Because a lot of that's, I think a lot, a lot of people get into it that way. Because I, I do remember, you know, being on the other end of that, being that stringer who, you know, I, I'd have clientele and, you know, their 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 kids are just getting serious into tennis where it's getting to the point where they really need a sponsorship for their shoes, right? Because uh -huh. they're, they, they're wearing out those shoes like, like it's like crazy, right? And to keep, you know, putting down $50, $75, you know, every, almost every month or even more sometimes, right. was just not feasible, you know, and then the stringing on top of that, right. If you have three or four rackets and, and of course you're trying out new strings and then it, it gets to be a big bill. I, I mean, I even, you know, I knew quite a few um, uh, parents at that time, you know, that were doing that with their juniors, you know, they're almost like mortgaging their homes, you know, putting second mortgages on their yeah. houses to get money out to, uh, to um, you know, finance their kids' tennis. I mean, it's expensive when you have you know uh, those group lessons every week, and then you got the private lessons, and then you got to travel, 
and then all that kind of stuff. So, you know, at some point you start getting some things for free, right? And that's how, I, that's really how Babylon really got first started, right? They were, they were out there at those junior tournaments. They were giving out frames to people like, hey, try this out, try this out. I think that's really what got Babylon in the U.S. market, you know, back, back in the day, right? And so, you know, because at that time, Wilson and Prince were pretty dominant in the market. I think they had, a, at one point, they almost had like an equal, like 50 and, you know, or close to it, right? Like they each had about 40% market share or, or they were pretty up there, you know, pretty close. I mean, that was in the days when Prince, you know, was strong, right? But it's gone through a lot of, uh, a lot of different changes since then and so forth. But, but yeah, so, you know, I, I can totally, I can totally get that. And that totally makes sense. Um, uh, and, and having that drop weight, you know, that, that was probably a good learning tool because at that time you didn't know what you didn't know and you didn't know what you, what you wanted. Yeah, you know, and I started out, you know, with just a little game of drum weight, and it came with a book. That's all I did. I just sat down and watched them or read the book and yeah. followed the instruction of the book to try to figure it out. Yeah, you're, you're kind of cutting out a little bit um, on your mic. The mic's okay. kind of cutting out in and out a little bit. I don't know. I'll try to talk better. But, yeah, I'm on my cell phone. Like I said, I had an emergency trip. I had to take the Dallas last night, so I had to do this on my cell phone. Oh, oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, yeah, so just let me know, you know, how much time and, and stuff that you have and, you know, uh, but yeah, but this is great. Um, so, so you started with the, the drop weight machine and then, and then uh, when did that turn into like, hey, I want to do, the, I want to stream for other people. Well, I, it's, <laughs> so I, I used the drop weight and I used it, I don't know, probably a couple of years and uh, I kind of wanted electronic machine. And one of the uh, clubs in town, they were getting ready to upgrade. They got the one of the Alpha Ghost machines, mm -hmm. and they were getting rid of their old machine. I went and talked to them, but they had a crank, and I really didn't want a crank. And uh, so I ended up, I bought the Gamma Progression, which apparently is a super popular machine. So it's yeah. good. I'm, I'm assuming it's a good entry-level machine. A lot of home guys. So it's pretty reliable. I mean, it's not fantastic, but it's a good machine. But I bought that one. And, okay. I'll tell you the whole story. So the story is, when we were traveling around with our kid, going to tournaments, when she was playing for a high school, she, you know, we'd go to some school, or not high school, but middle school. We'd go to some of the schools, you know, and our kids would show up wearing uniforms, had tennis bags, wearing tennis shoes, you know, got Wilson and Babylon rackets and all these. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd go out to play these schools on, you know, the little, I like it, I don't know what, what I don't know. Less, I don't know, the poorer schools in town. Yeah. And we show up, you know, those kids, they're playing kids that were wearing flip flops and khakis or sandals and jeans. And uh, I told my wife that I wanted to get a machine so that I could stream rackets, learn better, know better, not get a racket, get a machine, get a better machine so that I could try to get those kids more involved in tennis, if that makes sense. So yeah. they were out there playing with, you know, the cheap little $20 aluminum rackets you get Academy or Walmart. Right. And uh, they didn't know anything. So that's really kind of how I approached it to start. And I still do that today. I still do a lot of stuff for free. For yeah, you meant, you mentioned that. And I was, like, thinking just when you were talking now, like, you know, I've kind of seen that with the racket side of it. You know, like the USTA, you know, sometimes has those drives where they're like, you know, please, if you have a racket, donate or whatever. And then they, they try to give it to um, – schools and they try to give it to um programs you know community programs and so forth but i guess i just never really thought about that for stream because at that at a certain level when the kids are getting to the point where they need to have their rackets restrung they still have to pay somebody 15 20 a racket or whatever and, yeah. and so you know who who's that going to be and so so that would that is i mean that seems like a, it would be a great opportunity to give back um, you know, uh, I'm have I took my own money. I bought string, I bought the machine, and uh, you know, we'd go to the tournaments, whether we go to the city tournaments or wherever. And I'd take all that stuff with me. You know, and those kids that you know break a string, I'd go over and string the racket for free. Uh, you know, I, I wanted them to have what my kid had the opportunities to have. You know, because they didn't have that. Right, so, and that's why even today, my wife has started a charity uh, where we're kind of doing that in our community too like today is, is it is it based around so, tennis or is it based around yeah, is it yeah she did it more uh, it's got it. charity. Wait, well west texas pro tennis oh okay but, uh, and so and how does it work i mean how does the charity work 
Well, we get donations. She's the one that sponsors the pro tour. So that's where we get most of our money from. We get sponsors. And then, like today, she kicked off a veterans program. So as far as we know, in the state of Texas, there was no specifically veterans program for tennis. So we had a guy come in from Houston who's a wheelchair player. Uh, but anyway, she kicked off a veterans program. But it's the same thing where we're going to the other schools, the lower income schools, and we're trying to get equipment, better equipment for their players. Uh, the ones that don't have shoes, go ahead and buy some shoes and get to those players. Or uh, even our local university started an academy, maybe pay membership or you know their fee to get them into their academy. Oh, that's all we're right. trying to do. Yeah, but that, we're young. We're we you know, only been around for about a year and a half. Right. Huh. That yeah. I mean, that sounds like uh, that could really go places. You know, with um, oh, we're open. you know, with uh, you know, it, everybody can use. You know, any state could use that programs like that. And I hadn't really heard a lot of, about the programs. You know, specifically for tennis. And you know, there's probably a lot of opportunity to get some of the larger companies. You know, to to maybe you know get involved and support that, mm-hmm. you know, that, yeah, I could, cause that tennis is, you know, seems to be one of those sports that it's pretty costly. Right. I mean, you know, the yeah, rackets right. keep used then the bags and, um, and, and it's something that you have to keep recycling, you know, constantly. It's not, you not like yeah, you you know, we got into it with the kid. We thought, Oh, great. This would be a good cheap sport, you know, and $10,000 later. We're like, Holy crap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. Totally. Right. That was only the first year. So, so what do you do as far as strings? Because, you know, we're talking about, um, uh, you know, you're, you probably don't have connections with the, with the manufacturers or the companies, you know, you don't have trade accounts because you, you're, you know, you string mostly for tournaments and part-time and, and so forth. It sounds like though, the amount of, uh, the, um, the, the volume that you do almost seems like, uh, that's like a full-time volume for some shop. I mean, small shops, sometimes might not do do the kind of volume that you're doing as a as a part-time you know um stringer but it's the yeah, I, I have been told the, same, the city i live in we're, we're population about 300 thousand and i have been told through the tennis community i am by volume the biggest stringer in the world wow how yeah, many shops do you have, you know, how, many have what's that? How, many, how many standalone shops do you have in your town like tennis shops we only have the one tennis shop one specialty okay. store. Uh, but stringing-wise, we have a tennis center. They string. We have a country club that they have a stringer. And then there's a few home stringers in town. Uh, I string for the university, uh, a tennis club, and two country clubs, plus just my local group, a group mm-hmm. of people. And I looked uh, a couple of days ago, and on like my customer base, I have 319 i think just individuals i stream for wow. plus the other stuff so, so it, how do you know that i'm doing about 100 to 150 a month just from them yeah, i mean that's that's some pretty good volume how do you keep track i'd like to uh, you know hear from you how you keep track of all that i mean in in my experience you know um when you have a small customer base you know you can keep a, a card like a three by five card and you can keep it in a filing cabinet or you can or in a in a little file or you could keep it on a spreadsheet you know on the computer but i always found that you know when you're in you know when you're stringing for four to six to what, whatever amount of hours that you're stringing you know to take the time to go into your computer and put all that information in so it seems laborious you know at times so how have you found a system that works for you. I mean, I know there's online places as well, like stream. No, I, well, you know, I'm, I'm just a simple guy, and I'm not like super techie friendly. But I just developed. I've got four Excel databases that I keep. One of them is just for the university plus visiting teams. I got one for the ITF. Uh, I've got one for my local customers, and I have just a spare one that I've created that I actually share with people all the time. So I have people all the time asking me for my little database. And uh, I have it linked to a Dymo la- uh, label printer. Mm-hmm. And so that's all I do. I just record everything in my little database. I print it over. It's got a little uh, invoice that I've got in it with a macro. So every time I refresh it, it'll save my invoice to a separate folder. And, but that's all I do. I just keep everything on an Excel database. 
you know, and now that you say that, that's also going to be really important. Um, there's some work being done outside here. I'm going to have to probably get my headphones. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, when we like when we're uh, string like when when uh, when you're at a tournament and you're stringing, you know, you get the, the information from the last year's tournament. So, you know, on what days that you're going to have a large number of brackets coming in, you know, and so you can kind of see where the the big days are going to be. So like, you know, for you on some of those, uh, and you know, if you're stringing at a tournament, um, those small tournaments, and, and it might just be you or one other person on those days when you have that influx of rackets, you know, you might get some additional help or, or kind of plan your day a little bit better. So, you know, keeping good records cannot help you just for now, but it can help you, oh, you know, yeah, absolutely. For, that, for that future. Um, which, yeah. which is, you know, so, so, uh, you know, aside from, so it sounds like you have a, a system that works. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go see if I can grab some headphones. I'll be right okay. back. <laughs> All right, I'm back. Yeah, there's next door. The house next door is doing some some work, so I had to kind of. That's a little bit better, at least done that way. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. All right, perfect. Uh, okay, so yeah, you know, um, keeping keeping good records. I mean, I know there's online databases. There's there's a, a website called Stringjob.com. I don't know if you've heard yeah, of I it. I actually started just doing them when they were free. Yeah, and you know, then when they started charging money. Yeah, uh, that's, that's uh, well. I can take all that data, put that same data into an Excel spreadsheet, and just do it myself. Yeah, I think what I liked about it, I used them when they were free, and then I, I, there was a point where, um, on my web because I had a blog, and and so I would like sometimes talk about them, and so he he gave it to me free for a while, and and then I don't I don't use it anymore, but um, yeah, it it was kind of nice because you could put all the information in there. And then it send you could send emails out or like reminders, and it was just a good central place to keep everything. But again, it's one of those you know software as a service kind of thing. So if you stop paying for the service, you yeah. don't have access to all that information anymore, and so you have to download it and do something different. So yeah, and, I, but, and if I remember when they first started charging, if I remember, you were still allowed to have a free account. I'm going to say a hundred or fewer people or it might've been less yeah. than that. Yeah. It was something like that, either 50 or hundred customers. And after that you, you, you had to pay the 1995 a month or 995 or I'm not sure, but you know, it's a good I idea. Know, several of them out there now. Oh, is there? Yeah. I mean, it's a good idea. Uh, it just, uh, you know, sometimes you need it. Sometimes you, you, you don't, you know, um, but, but aside, okay. So as far as buying strings, have you found, uh, a central place that you do all your purchasing or do you have just kind of as you see good deals no i actually so i'll tell you my whole string story so when i first started and i really started to get serious i i called everybody i called wilson babylon yonex head i called everybody and again because i'm not a brick and mortar nobody would work with me except yeah. Selenko. So right we don't care we'll work with anybody so they set me up with an account and i was using probably 80 percent selenko string at the time and this was popular where I was. it wasn't a big deal mm -hmm. uh but yeah i kept shopping around kept shopping around i just buying stuff i guess i was getting off of the poly tennis warehouse to be honest mm -hmm. everything else but i shopped around yeah i found a, a guy well, I, you know most people probably know it, the guy over in england i don't know if i'm allowed to say it or not but yeah i know who you're talking about because okay. uh brad, I found and I were, brad and i were talking about them um yeah uh, just yeah, recently so I told and, brad to use them. oh really? and, uh, they've been real good to me you know they set me up an account and um and and i'll, and I'll be honest here i can buy the stream from them on a monday and i can have it in my house on thursday from england I can buy a string from Tennis Warehouse on Monday, and I might not get it till the next week. 
Yeah, it, I, that's it's kind of crazy because I mean, yeah, I I don't see how that I, I haven't ordered anything from them, but I'm gonna try just to see. Um, and and they have better options of of tools and and just things that you wouldn't find readily available, uh, uh, you know, in the U.S. market. But you know, good good quality stuff like from Babylon and other other things and you know, just you know accessories and stuff. But um, so. Uh, yeah, tennis warehouse, you know, it seems to be more of a retailer that gives you a little bit of a discount, right? I mean, if you're, it's the same thing, like if you're a member of the USRSA, you know, you get a little bit of discount from like Alpha and, and uh, Gamma Strings and a few other ones, but nothing, you know, significant, maybe 10% off here or there, um, you know, places like Tennis Express and Tennis Warehouse and Do It Tennis and all those kind of online, you know, from it though, you can set up a, a wholesale account. You know, I don't yeah, know if you yeah, have an account through the, with from it. There used bought. to be, um, there used to be one called RMS, uh, Rocky mountain sports, but they're no longer in business. I think, yeah. uh, I think they stopped a couple years ago. Those guys were great. They were an actual wholesale. I mean, they were actually a, a, a middle, a, a, I guess, wholesaler, you know, yeah, I have an account, account. distributing down in Houston, but no, oh, I haven't heard of that one. From Iraqi right there. Mm-hmm. Um, cause that, you know, cause that really helps out, uh, you know, to get some kind of discounts, you know, and I have noticed if you, if you check like on places like eBay and stuff, you know, I've kind of talked about this in the past, you have to be careful of where did this string come from? Right. Cause it could have, you know, because I've been on the other end of this where like you're at a, you're stringing at a tournament and you get some free string. Okay. So you take that home with you and then, uh, you might sell it on eBay. That's fine. Or it could have been in some player's um, bag for like months on end. And then he's just giving you old stock. Maybe he changed strings. So, you know, uh, it, it, it passed, you know, a couple hands and it could have been sitting out in the sun or, you know, out in the back of somebody's car for, you know, weeks or months. Right. So you don't know the history of it. Um, if the packaging is old, that kind of can tell you something, right. Cause you can sometimes on eBay, you can find some, some Wilson string that, has evolved like probably four or five generations, right? Some of the packaging. And it's just like, are you kidding? You know, I mean, <laughs> and people are trying to sell it. And, you know, for some strings, it might not really matter too much, depending on who it's for or, or what you're yeah. doing. But, but really, you're going to lose some of that elasticity, right? And, you know, especially if you're looking at multifilaments or, or even natural gut, you know, I'm not going to, because some people are still trying to sell it for near, the, the cost, the value of it, you know, even though it's, you know, a couple generations back, but you can find some good deals on, um, on eBay, but you have to be consistent, right? So last night, actually, I was looking on there. You can get a reel of Luxalon or, um, uh, rough, uh, Lou, uh, power rough. I think it was 17, 18, you know, the, the typical silver, you know, or, uh, you know, the regular colored string, that they have for that it's a real you know it's a seven what, what is it 720 or 660 whichever in that one it is and yeah, it depends see i always thought they were 720 but i've seen yeah, some of their reels that are 660 so i think yeah so you gotta you gotta really know you gotta really look but they were 139 right and that's a 300 dollar reel yeah so that's not bad there's a couple on there um and they were even offering free shipping in the free for continental us right so you can find some good deals. Um, you just have to really look. Um, but sometimes the time effort isn't always worth it, right? Because you, you yep. need to have qu quantity and stuff like that. And I mean, like you're talking about Selenko. You know, Selenko is actually coming out with a uh, uh, tournament grade uh, stringing machine. So they're, yep, they're getting absolutely. serious into. Yeah, it looks pretty cool, right? It's, I think it's right now just in the stages of final uh, development. And then it'll be coming out i mean they've they've got the machines but i think they're they're not uh, out to the public yet you know they're not right. um selling yeah, they them yet them in Kalamazoo or something like that, where yeah they out. look pretty nice actually i, yeah, I don't know did. what the price point is i don't know what the price point is going to be I, I would imagine i'm uh, probably five six thousand you know to kind of compete with if i were to guess i'm probably wrong i'm going to say 30 to 35 wow. well, i might be wrong that would be like, that would I be that just because they're making the same factory as the head and the Gilson and mm -hmm. uh, Alpha and I mean a whole slew of different machines that are all made in the same factory and that's the price range most of those are going at. Right. See, that's the thing is like you don't really know which I mean because you know when Wilson actually was making the Biardo, right? 
they had some of their engineers, you know, at the tournament trying, you know, because we're sitting there with the clamps. It's like, oh, this is not working so good or this is working good. What do you like about this machine? How's, you know, how's all this working? You know, they're con completely, you know, continually evolving, right? Uh, as mm -hmm. they were initially producing it, you know, because they did want to go into retail. That I mean, that was their first um, big uh, move into the stringing, you know, retail. Um, and they wanted to be part of that space. And so this was going to be huge for them. So they are part of that production. I mean, it still came out of probably a factory in China, right? I mean, they're not going to make it in the U.S. I mean, they're not going to physically be putting this machine together in the United States. You know, we know, we know that most of the tennis products come out of, you know, two or three factories out of, out of yeah, China, they turn, right? They turn into China. Yeah. yeah, or time. Yeah. And so, um, so I'm wondering, you know, how many of those other machines, like you see the Technifiber, you see the the prints, you see the uh, Solinko, like you're talking about, um, you know, are those all pretty much, I mean, are a lot of those computer components fairly similar and they're just being packaged under other people? That's kind of, you know, that would be my concern. Um, Babolat might be taking a little more of their own, you know, because... Mm -hmm. Babylon's a little bit different than Yonix. I think that's a little bit different too. That's going to be more of a yeah, Japanese. Most of the Yonix, the upper Yonix are all made in Japan, but the the new the the five, I think I think it is made in Taiwan or China now. Yeah, I, I mean, because Yonix does have one uh, machine which is a pretty good price point. It's like that seventy one hundred. Uh, you know, it just looks it looks real simple. You know, but it's computerized and and you know they're they have quality components in there and stuff. And so I would say, you know, it wouldn't be a bad, that wouldn't be a bad, um, you know, option for uh, that price point. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, even Gamma right now, they've got those, what is it? The 90, 9600 or 90, I wrote it down somewhere like a 9800 or 9900 um, ELS. It's a six point mounting, but it's like $5,900. And I'm like going, you know, you don't see those kind of machines. You're not going to see a gamma or an alpha machine at a professional tournament. If mm. it's a higher tier professional tournament, you know, a lot of it is just the exposure, right? Players, you know, professional players, they know Babolat, they know Head, and those are the companies that are sponsoring these tournaments as well. So, you know, you're not going to see it at those. Now, the smaller events, you know, the 32 draws, you know, some of the smaller WTA or or, or even ATP tournaments where it's two or three stringers, many times you're bringing your own machine to the tournament. Even then, I I, I would feel kind of weird bringing a gamma machine to the tournament. They'd be like, oh, okay, you, you know, you're kind of from just the local club, right? <laughs> but, you know, if you have a Wilson machine, the Bayardo, where they see at all the other tournaments, or you have a um, Babolat machine, they're going to know like, oh, you're serious, right? It's just image, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it, it it's not truth really because we know that many of those sh machines are, are going to be pretty uh, competitive in, in, in all of the features and they're going to be as reliable, right? Those top tier mm -hmm. um, tournament level machines are going to be just as reliable. I mean, um, people ask me questions like, Hey, what do you think of the wise, um, you know, uh, what is it? The uh, 2086 or 2071. Uh, yeah. The 20, 20 yeah. 2086. Yeah. Um, you know, I know, I remember when Herb was way back in the day when he was promote, when he was just getting it started, right. He would go to tennis shops. I was in, um, in the market back then in Southern California. So that's, you know, he would go to all the shops and say, what do you guys think of this? And I'm like thinking, well, there's really no use for tennis shops for this kind of thing, because we've already gone beyond that. Right. Why would we put, put this thing, but it has a really good purpose, right. For putting it on to, um, uh, you could turn a, if you have a really good, uh, crank machine that has a good six point mounting system. And instead of getting rid of it, you can turn that thing into a, 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 a computerized machine now that, you know, pulls within point one, you know, I mean, the reliability is really good. I mean, and he can keep uh, upgrading it. You know, I think it, yep. it's already in it's in like seven, eight, nine, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, models or version. yeah. versions. Yeah. So he's, you know, he's, he's always able to keep up with the latest technology. But if you buy like a Babolat, even like a Babolat star five, which is maybe what, 10 years old now. I don't, I don't know mm -hmm. how, I don't remember yeah. now how old that would be eight, nine, yeah, 10 years old. You, you've got technology that's 10 years old. I mean, it's still reliable and stuff, but if you buy, you know, this, uh, uh, 
the the uh, the wise machine, you might be getting a lot newer technology, right? Mm. So how do you how do you you know count uh, you know count for that you know? But you your equipment, right? You it sounds like you've switched to the Wilson. The Wilson, because you have more than one machine. I've seen that in some of your videos that you do. You've yeah, got, yeah, I've got the regular Wilson, and then I've got the L. Okay, so what is aside from? I mean, I know you know you don't have the ergonomics in the the electronic um, lift system, and uh, you know that, and and you can't set it up for more than yourself. You can't add extra stringers in there for for that kind of thing, and it's all manual as far as lifting it, and it's lighter. For be probably better for taking it to a tournament, you can put it on a desk. Yeah, it's not that much lighter, but it's lighter. So, what else is the difference between? Because there's a big price difference. I mean, because that model you can pick up for thirty seven hundred, while you're going to probably pay at least five to six for the the full Biardo. Yeah, the the full one, the cheapest I ever see it here in the states is six, and I've seen oh, yeah. it for up, up to ten thousand five. I think I've seen it. Some but, yeah, well, it's in demand still. I mean, and and I'm okay. wondering, have have they updated it, or are are I haven't talked any because so, Ron? You yes. Know, yeah. Okay. The okay. Here's the way I'm to understand it. The so the L varies in that. Okay, like you said, it doesn't have the motors to raise it or tilt it, but you can still raise it or tilt it manually. Right. Uh, the tilt it, you know, has a little range. Um, the base clamps are different because they're not gravity release. Yeah, and the clamps are a five tooth instead of the four tooth. Okay, and the posts are made where they will come in for badminton. But I don't do badminton, so that doesn't matter. No, but that's and nice. So, the okay. computer is just you know analog little computer. I mean, there's nothing fancy about it, so you can't say anything. You can't say. Anything. But the what I have heard, the new Wilson, the regular machine, now comes with the five tooth clamps. And the new uh, turntable, so that the posts come in for badminton. Okay. Okay. So, so they the, are made some a little bit. slight changes, I guess. Okay. But would you feel that? Let's say you only had the light. Would you feel uh, pretty comfortable with that machine? And would you? I mean, would you say, "Hey, you know what? I like this machine. I don't need all the features of, you know, the the regular model." Yes. Uh, it's, it's a good machine. I mean, it's almost identical other than just those those minor features. You know, the polar head's the same, all electronics the same, you know, all that's the same. So, yeah, I like it. I mean, it's a good machine. My only issue is, and it calls, I bought it as a backup because when I bought it, it was actually my third machine. I, had, I keep two at my house and I keep one at the actual university. And uh, so it was my third machine. So when I bought it, it was just going to be a backup there at my house. Mm -hmm. and the only issue I have with it, because I'm kind of a little older, and I have arthritis, so the clamps being the twist lock clamp base, I have, I'm not, I'm not going to say it's hard, but it's not the easiest thing for me to get in there, twist on the shuttle. No, they yeah. release pretty easy. Yeah, I mean, you make a good point, because it's like, it's that extra motion, right? Yep. And it's like, and, and some of the other machines that are computerized, and or that have just, uh, you know, um, standard uh clamps will have that problem after a while where you have to like reef you know you have to like push it further to get mm -hmm. it to even lock the base because you know one unlocking there goes your whole string job right yep. you know it just takes one one of those and so you want to have a stable system i mean you want to have a system that isn't going to you know falter at all because a lot of times if you're stringing kind of quick and you have to have that motion you know how the motion's supposed to be and you're always going to be need to be counting on just having to do it a certain way you can't always have to like you know you know undo it and do it you know going back and forth i could see where that would wear on you after a while so having you know the lockout having just that automatic clamp um or having a quick you know having an easy release is a nice feature to have yep um, yeah, if, so, if it was, I mean, even if it was kind of like, uh, you know, let's go back to gamma, kind of the gamma base, the standard little base clamp for that, where it just has a little lever you push over, mm -hmm. that would even be easier than me having to grab something that's round and trying to twist it. Oh, yeah. Because that's why it makes it difficult. Wait a minute. Which one has the the twist, the round twist one? That's the Which L model. One? It You have to twist it? Yeah. So, yeah, when you, so like when you grab the base, you have to right. turn it. To get it to lock, and oh. instead of being like a lever, it's like a little 
round, almost round thing that you have to grab to twist around. I've seen well, that. I've really seen that on some other. Like no, I've seen that on some other machines. Yeah, I don't know if I would like that. Um, I'm used to either an easy release, you know, lever, like you're talking, you know, that you can just, or the, you know, quick, re the automatic release ones, you know, because yep. um, I know some of the Babolat ones. The one, I think, the one, the machine that had the, that had the one clamp that you know rotates 360 around you just push it down you know it's like a yep. real easy you know almost pneumatic or something i don't know but it you know it, it was it was just nice right and because if you're stringing like you know you're stringing thousands of rackets right i mean that's a lot of wear and tear that you know um so you got it maybe that's you know the thought that you have to think of when you're buying a, 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 a higher you know level machine that you're going to be using a lot you know um it might be worth spending that little bit extra yeah to, you know no and and again, because I am a home home string, that's all I, I do some tournaments and stuff. But primarily, I'm a home string. Mm -hmm. And but I guess volume wise, so I do do enough rackets that if I had to string solely on that machine, it would wear on me pretty quick. So the, that's why I'm in the market. Now, probably January ish, if they're back in stock, I'll get another of the regular Bayardos and stick it in my house. And that one's going to go to the university. Mm -hmm. just because i'll just keep it over there for like game days right you know, I, I might do one or two rackets during a match or right. if i'm going over there to pick rackets up, uh, yeah pick up one or two rackets i can just string them there and leave them but you know if i'm picking up 15 or 20 i'll just take them to the house okay but well what do you that, yeah it didn't wear yeah. on you after a while i mean what do you think about buying used machines because i was kind of thinking about that in another video that i just did i was talking about that because you know, I had seen that a Biardo come up on eBay a couple of days ago, and I knew it would sell within hours. I was like, yeah, and it did. Going. When you told me about it, yep. I wouldn't look, and it was gone. Yeah, it, and the thing is, you know, thirty-eight hundred dollars. Um, they even had the box, so it kind of looked nice and new. But he did, you know, he was honest, and he said, "Well, it's had, you know, a hundred thousand pulls." And so when you, you know, divide that up, it's probably been at um, about seven or eight tournaments. You know, and that's so it probably came straight from Wilson. You know. Uh, mm -hmm. it probably came, you know, he got it, maybe he was a tournament stringer. He got it from somebody, um, because sometimes, you know, they'll give the, the stringers that, that work at those tournaments a deal. And, and, um, at a certain time they phase them out right after they've been at enough tournaments. And I'm like thinking $3,800 for a machine. That's probably at least four years old, five years old. That's been kind of, you know, transport transported to many tournaments that's been used by a bunch of stringers at, you know, at a high level like that. How much life do you think it has left before it needs some type of uh, intervention, you know? Well, you know, I, I agree. I kind of thought about that because when you start thinking the pull count that was on that, that had to be close to 3,000-ish rackets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know what the lifespan of it's going to be. You know, mine's got almost 5,000 on it. And, you know, I don't... You know, I don't know because I'm starting to have little quirks with it. Really? Like what? I mean, what kind of things? Good, what kind quirks. of things? Like what? Like what's happening? Uh, every once in a while, like okay, you know how you have the buttons on it that'll tilt it for mains and then crosses. Every once in a while, I'll hit for the crosses, and instead it'll just go back down to starting position. You have to hit it again; it'll come back up. Oh. So just quirks. Uh -huh. I mean, it's right. still strange, fine, still everything's fine yeah. about it, but I'm getting quirks. And then you think about the then you think about the clamps, you know. Um, yeah, the clamps I mean, that's replaceable, but that's a that's a cost. You know, clamps are one of the more expensive uh, replaceable parts, right? Yep. If you want to if you want to buy the same ones or better, sometimes you can upgrade or you know, there's options. Maybe can you upgrade from the L model clamps at all? Can you put the the, the regular ones? Yes, on? Yes, you could. Okay, so here's what I've learned about the L model. So you could change out the rails and the base clamps, but you know the base clamps are two hundred and fifty a piece or two forty a piece, something like that. Uh -huh. So there's five hundred dollars plus you got to buy the rails. The rails are like a hundred and twenty-five a piece, so there's another three hundred or two hundred and fifty. So now you're seven hundred and fifty dollars just to change out the rails and the base clamp, and that. But you're going to still have the four uh, four tooth clamp. Okay. Uh, X Spider over in Taiwan, they. So they have their little push down clamp, whatever they call it, that will fit the L, but you have to have them custom fit it in Taiwan. Okay. And, you know, they have, they have their U.S. company, which is a Torna, I think, okay. but they don't really know anything about it. You actually have to contact somebody in Taiwan oh. to get them to put it together. But again, it's still 250 bucks a piece. 
Okay. Okay. So yeah. So when you start thinking about that, like, um, do they both have the round, um, the bases? Are they, are they about the same? Like as far as does the base of the Bayardo and the L model look the same as far as they're a little bit rounded, you know, uh, to, to the reach, you know, um, uh, what do you call it on the, um, um, are the rails straight or are they, you know, a little bit okay, on the L model, they, they look the same, but they're not the same. Oh. So on the L model. Okay. So like on the regular, they have a little bit more curves and the rail is actually flat, you know, flat, kind of like a smooth surface. Yeah. Whereas the, on the regular, on the L model, it's a little bit straighter and it's got a rougher surface. And, and I guess what, what where you really can't use them where they're different. So like on the base clamp of the L, mm -hmm. it has a, like a little round piece on the bottom that applies the pressure, whereas uh -huh. the regular Bayardo has the little rectangular one with the two okay. screws in it. Right. It is too wide to fit in the rail. Oh, okay. Now you can take the clamp, the base off of the L and use it on the regular, but you can't go the other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I like about you know machines like that and other other manufacturers as well, it allows you to reach the rackets. You know, if the racket is a little bit larger head, like mm -hmm. the, you know, it, it's nicer on the outer uh, mains, right, and the yeah. crosses because you can get closest closer to the to the frame when you're clamping. Because if the rails are straight, you know, sometimes it's it's hard to get out. Like my my uh, my old Babolat you know, uh, star three and star four had a little bit of trouble with that. Cause you couldn't quite get as far out as you wanted. I mean, the clamps were a little bit wider, but you just, it was a little bit hard sometimes, you know, on, on the larger head. So it's nice that they, they have the, you know, they've, they've upgraded, um, uh, machines so that they have that, um, you know, the, uh, the bases like that and stuff. So, I mean, yeah, just little things like that, right. Just make yeah. a big difference. Uh, some people, you know, some of the, the, the machines, you know, some of the machines have like, uh, you know, all the different, you know, trays that you can store your stuff in and pull string through to measure that holds all the reels. You know, that's more of a retail. That's more designed for retail. Right. You know, mm -hmm. all those little features. Um, but I know on tour and stuff, you know, one thing, you know, we're like, OK, yeah, you know, we want to put our phones in there. Right. You know, our, our cell phones. So they have now they have like, you know, some some of the. uh <clears throat> machines have like a little USB, you know, so that you can charge your phone on there and, you know, have it there. So yeah, just little awesome. things like that. Right. But, um, but yeah, I mean, so, so it sounds like you're, you're willing to stick with that machine. Then, yeah. We'll yeah I, like, I mean, I like it. It's a good machine and I, I don't have any problems with it. So I'll stick and, with it. And good resale. And really, if you do have, I don't know what the warranty on them is. Like if you buy them new, maybe three, five years or something. Uh, yeah, it's a three and five years. Uh, three years on electronics and five years on mechanicals or something. And, and you know, knowing that Wilson's in the U.S., you know, they're there in Chicago, right? So it at least getting the parts and at least getting maybe service if you really need. There's enough people that have the machines that um, you can probably solve your problem, right? But if you're buying one of these machines that, you know, have a small representation here in the U S or, you know, from, from a company that just doesn't have a lot of support, you know, in their back end, mm -hmm. you could be stuck. I mean, you, oh, you have yeah, a nice absolutely. machine, but once electronics go out, you know, you're, you're kind of, you know, stuck by yourself, right? You just spend all that money and, and you're out. So when you're buying a used computerized machine, you got to think about all of that stuff, you know, yeah. it might seem like a good deal, up front but then maybe if i pay a little bit more and get a new one i might be better off because at least for the last next three to five years you know you're okay i mean you know we do have uh what's tennismachines.com i think yeah, it is. Authorized, uh, for the oh really okay so yeah call I mean, wilson they're all they do. oh really yeah i mean i know he's he's probably uh, that doing well i mean i i know it's slow response sometimes and they used to sell you know, use machines as well, but their inventory yeah, is really them, low. So, yeah. yeah. They refurbish them and, and stuff, but you know, the cost of shipping and all that kind of stuff. And then the repairs and, you know, if you don't have to get them repaired, buy something that's a little bit more, uh, that, that the performance rating is a little bit higher. And Wilson yeah. seems to be, yeah. Wilson seems to be a pretty good one. You know, um, I, you know, that's maybe why they're in such demand. Right. I mean, I know even, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, Brad, you know, he was, you know, getting a machine and he, he was able to, pick one up so um, mm -hmm. he's, yeah, he's pretty happy 
yep he's pretty happy so i don't know hopefully they're coming out with a new one i mean a, a new uh a new run of them or something right is that yeah like well you know different. actually i contacted him because you know everything as you know everything's hard to get with and uh so i was getting ready to place a string order and i couldn't even order string because they're out of everything and uh contacted them and uh, most of the string is supposed to be back in stock middle of this month or middle of next month and they think they'll have the machine they think back in stock end of december okay well that'll be that'll be good and stuff yeah i'm, I'm kind of been looking at looking at that myself um so yeah i don't know we've been just kind of just rambling on on that but that but that's some good conversation because it's like it's it's good to like kind of hear from other um other stringers you know across the country and stuff what what they're facing and what you know what their um what their market is and sounds like um uh with your um you're not traveling for stringing but you have enough tournaments coming into your city that um it really makes it pretty because you know some of the things that you said as far as um there's you know the ncaa tournaments sometimes and the the small itf 15ks um that come through and so is that just you yeah i'd like to actually just touch on that a little bit because many times when you know um stringers are trying to get into you know stringing beyond just you know at the club or whatever and they want to get into professional stringing one thing i always say is you know go check out in your local area what's happening at the college level you know because when there's tournaments you know and there's all that you know teams from uh, other other cities and all that you know coming together in one place um somebody obviously has to be set up to string right and go talk to them go check it out because even if you're just cutting out the string and just sitting there and taking the information in you know, that would be a way for you to like learn what it's about and, you know, see if that's interesting to you and, you know, just learn and, and, and watch the person stringing and all that. Right. So, um, because many times you can't just do it all yourself. You need somebody else or at least a backup. So how do you handle that? Yeah. Uh, I'll take this year. I actually had a guy come in to help me for the first three days. Uh, but the ones I've done in the past, I've just done on my own. And the last year that we had a 25 team when I strung it, it was just it was a crazy year. Because the same week that we were having the 25K, there was like, I think Oklahoma had like an 80K. Oh. I think California had like a 125 or something like that. And they all canceled. So oh. we ended up getting a lot of top 100 players at our 25K. But what's the draw? What's the draw? Hope we had a 62 year. that year. Okay, so that's a good enough. That's a good number whatever, of players. Okay, okay. And did you have the qualifying for that too, or is that already? Yeah, that was with qualifying. Yeah, okay. we have. Yeah, we had a sixty-four qualifying draw, but a thirty-two main draw. Okay. But uh, yeah, the first day, uh, I'll tell you, it's, I've always found this to be a funny story. But uh, the first day it was a Friday. I wasn't even supposed to set up the string until Saturday, and I, was, I had a real job, and I was actually going to work, and I just <laughs> take my stuff and drop it off that Friday. Right, and uh, as soon as I pulled the machine out of the back of my car, I had people start coming up. So I told my boss, "Hey, I'm not going to make it to work. I'm just going to stay here." And I figured, you know, I'd get ten or fifteen rackets. I got sixty-one rackets the first day. How did you? Man I mean, do you have somebody helping you at least taking the information? Uh, my, thankfully, my daughter was in town, and she did the intake and cut the string. Up. So all I had to do was string, and I think I started the first racket probably about seven thirty in the morning. I didn't finish till two thirty that night. But still, that's, I mean, obviously you have two machines sitting there in case there's an emergency and you have to go to another, yeah, well, you have yeah, to string somebody else's. That tournament, just oh, in man. case, but I didn't have any strangers that could come in. Uh, I had a couple of guys in town that I'd call from time to time, but none of them showed up. Um, I need to get out there. I need to... about <laughs> or something. Wife jumped over there. She's good for about three rackets, and then she's pretty done. Oh. <laughs> but but yeah. this year... I actually had, and it's kind of funny, so this topic, so, so this is for people out there that think they want to get into this tournament stuff. There's a lot of guys out there when they start stringing, they, I mean, this is the idea, they got light bulbs going off. Oh, my God, I'm going to be a tournament string. I'm going, oh, this is my dream. Mm -hmm. And be careful what you wish. So this, it's not as easy as a lot of people think it is, you know. I mean, you go knock out something on your drop weight on your coffee table, and you think, oh, yeah, I'm going to do a 1,000 of them. It's not that easy. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I had a kid come in. And I told him, I promise you, I'll pay you at least a thousand bucks. We're charging twenty a racket. I, told him, I promise you, I'm gonna get you fifty racket before you leave. He's there for two and a half days. I said, I'll get you fifty racket. And 
he got the 48 and he had to, he stopped. He said, I can't get it. I mean, he, he could barely drive home. And still yeah. So bad. yeah. What you don't realize is um, usually what happens when you first, like if, let's say if you haven't been stringing that kind of volume and you get to a tournament, after about a day, you start taping up your fingers. Mm -hmm. And then every night after, you know, 12, 14 hours, you put your fingers in some, you know, uh, water or, or, or something that kind of can, uh, you know, uh, alleviate some of the pain. Yeah, and, perhaps and, salt or something. Yep, yeah, exactly. And then it takes a couple days um, for your fingers to kind of, you know, feel a little bit better. And then you start, you know, your wrists and your hands start, you know, feeling it, you know, because you're pulling poly, you know, through these 18 mm -hmm. by 20 um, string patterns all day long. And, and you crack fingers, all that stuff. Yep. And you stand up all day, um, you know, for 15, 18 hours with your neck bent. Yeah. It, it's glamorous, huh? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you know, I mean, that's the, the vision people have. You know, like, oh, I'm going to do it. I'm, this is my dream. And uh, like that kid, that was his dream. He wanted to do it. You know, he'd been stringing uh, here in Dallas for like four or five years, stringing at uh, a PGA store. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he thought, oh, yeah, I can do it. No problem. You know, and I said, he got 48 rackets. I said, we got more stacked up. He can do it. I mean, he, like I said, he. I called him when he got home. He was like, man, I can barely hold my steering wheel. Yeah. It was rough. That's, and, and, and when you have to do it for, you know, at least 10 days in a row or whatever, you know you're in it for the duration, mm -hmm. that first couple of days is hard at night. You know, you're just like, oh, man, this is only day one, you know? And yeah. so, yeah, I like 32 draws, small tournaments. I like small professional tournaments just because they're more relaxed. It's it's funner environment, and it's mm -hmm. not so – it's not so corporate, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, and this year uh, we did a men's and women's on the same week, and they were they both had a 48 uh, quality draw and a 32 main draw. So it's still I mean, you know, college is a little bit different, right? right? Some, of, some of the college players are going to be using the same racket for two or three matches, you know, or yep. they're not going to restring every, every match um, quite like, you know, pros, but – well, I would agree with you, but I'll disagree with you. When it comes to the pro tournament, the college players that made it in there, they would string every day, two or three rackets every day. But before the tournament, yeah, you know, I get, I'll get a three or four of them a week per player. And after that was like that, but during the pro tournament, yeah, they were bringing me two, three a day. Hmm. Yeah, and you know sometimes too, leaving the tournament, they if they if they know that you're doing a good job, and sometimes they'll get a couple strung just to have them when they go go to their new tournament, you know, the next place because they're not sure what they're gonna get at that next you know tournament. Yeah. So yeah, and I've, had, I've, had, and I've actually like there's some of the universities that know me, and so when they go on the road and you know starting January through what is that May or April, you know when they do their uh, team tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll hit the road, you know, they might go to two or three different universities before they come here. A lot of them have gotten to know me over the years. And they will save their rackets as much as they can until they get here and they'll drop off 20, 30 of them with me for a night. Oh, nice. So, and I think you, know, you, <laughs> you also talked about that you've been invited. I mean, it sounds like your name's getting out there and you've been invited to some WTA tournaments and stuff, but you, you, you're you sticking with the, uh, the college. I mean, that seems to be your market and it, yeah, and it works well, for you. I would say it's my market, but yeah, it's more of, I just don't want to travel, you know, I'm an older guy and I have stuff to do at home. And mm -hmm. if I was to get up and leave, you know, then who's going to string for the university while I'm gone? You know, there's a whole yeah. week that they need rackets. Who's going to string right. for the club while I'm gone? Right. You know? so, so either you get bigger, either you get bigger and expand and bring other people on board, or you just keep it as status yeah. quo. And like I said, you know, I am, I'm just a hobby stringer. Yeah. I mean, for the most part. And there's right. a high volume. Obviously. Yeah. I'm yeah. I mean, you've got some good. So got I don't have a quality. You know, and I have a real job that pays me well. Yeah. I have zero desire to travel <laughs> the world during tournaments. You know, I'm happy just doing it there at my house. Yeah. 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 It's a good perspective because, um, you know, you've got, you've got that and then you've got the charities that you're um, working on and you, you know, so you're promoting, you know, tennis in your community, which is even better, you know, um, you know, I think for the long, for the long haul, that's, you know, going to be, uh, reach a lot more people right and and so yeah i'd like to hear more about about that in the future you know what um you know that uh, that charity stuff that you're doing because um you know if you can if you can bring a bigger community to help support that you know um bringing in resources because 
that's kind of the big part of that, right? Is, yeah, I is think our, our next thing from what I told me today is we're going to try to bring wheelchair tennis to our area. Nice. Yeah, that's um, because uh, especially because you're in a in a fairly large city, so I would think that there's a there's got to be um, a market for that. I mean, there's got to be players out there. Yeah, we would think. Well, you know, I mean, I don't know what the market will be, but you know, there's a guy from our town who is just in the Olympics for wheelchair tennis. So there's got to be you know those players. Yeah, but they don't have anywhere to play. There's no league or anything there. So yeah, actually, I'm going to have goal, actually I'm going to have somebody. I'm going to do a video. I'm going to have somebody on on um, my channel who um, was a professional uh, wheelchair player. She's, she's a friend of mine here on on. She lives in in the islands here with uh, in in Hawaii as well now. Um, and she went. She played at the. Uh, she played. She was in Beijing, um, mm -hmm. um, Olympics and stuff too and stuff. And so yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because I I haven't really thought about you know like. Um, because obviously the game's a little bit different, right? If you're um, playing at that. Um, and as far as stringing, you know, would, would that change? You know, would you string your racket looser or would you, because, you know, um, it's a whole different different dynamic, right? The way that you play. And so I'm wondering like, you know, how does that, how does that change for your stringing? So I was going to, you know, I'll bring her on and, and um, you know, because that's always, you know, could be something interesting as well. Yeah, you know, and yeah, I'd be kind of curious about that too. Because again, I've, I've only got experience with one guy who's a mm -hmm. wheelchair player, and mm -hmm. uh, he's a quadriplegic, so he has to have a special racket, special gloves, or his racket falls out of his hand. But um, we were okay. kind of getting into the whole discussion yesterday about mm -hmm. stringing, what he uses, and all that like cat. And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. goes, so uh, props, I guess, to Tennis Express. They string them you know, for free. Oh, wheelchair tennis. Oh, that's nice. So, yeah, and and, and you know, speaking of tennis, uh, stringing, you know, um, through an online retailer, you know, that seems to have something that's evolved over the last couple years. As far as now, there's actually companies that do just online stringing. You know, I had thought about mm -hmm. that years ago. I'm like, hey, that maybe I could expand my market. You know, have people ship me rackets, and then I'll string them and then ship them back and there's now you know companies that just do that right oh um, yeah there's a bunch of them now uh yeah. you know just watching youtube you know you, there's several guys that are promoting that you know oh, you, this guy or this guy but, yeah there's a lot of those that popped up now and i didn't realize I I guess, locally because again yeah. i am from a fairly small town you know three hundred thousand. Yeah. but uh i had a guy contact me three four months ago about doing a racquetball racket so he brought it up for him and i didn't realize that we have a fairly decent sized racquetball community but that's what they do they don't have to know the hmm. out they yeah so i don't know i don't know you know profit wise to really make that work you know you really have to you really have to uh have a real vision for it because you know the shipping and um yeah, the volume, he, the volume and all that. What so. I gathered from him, so like I charged him a foot. I can't remember, so I don't have a but I put a 17 gauge Wilson Sensation in the tracker. Mm -hmm. Said he loved it, all that good stuff. Charged him 20 bucks. And he was telling me that was fantastic because he was paying upwards of 50 after he shipped one out, got it strung, had it shipped back to him. Perfect. Yeah, because a lot of people can't handle uh, racquetball rackets. Yep. on their machine or they're just not they don't have the they don't know how. strings yeah. they don't know how and you know you obviously you're going a lot lighter you're going what you're going 40 pounds or 30 pounds or i think he went 23 i think or, or yeah even lower right so yeah it's been a while since i've even strung a racquetball racket but yeah that's how i started i i just you know we had a racquetball club in our town and so i'm like i got my that's the only time i had a crank machine i had an alpha crank machine you know stand up and you know six point mounting and stuff but I would uh, promote my services at the, at the racquetball club, you know, and that's how I first got started before I, um, you know, uh, got into the, uh, the tennis clubs and, and, you know, getting business that way because nobody usually gets the racquetball clubs, you know, regularly, you know, to string and stuff. So it's a good, good way to maybe get some additional business. If you have a, a, a big following in your, in your community, yeah, if you're looking for business. Yeah. You yeah, sounds sounds like you've got sounds like you've got enough business, and uh, it sounds like it's working out out pretty well for you. It's yeah, really nice you know, and it's, 
And I hope every home stringer ever, you know, gets their dream. If they want a million freaking customers, I hope they get it. Um, I've kind of, be honest, I've kind of capped out where I'm at. I, I got a phone going off. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, no, that's fine. But uh, I've kind of gotten to the point where I've actually been training some guys to help absorb some of my customer base, I guess. So, you know, I've got... I don't know. No, everybody does what they do. Yeah. One of the things that I do is all the private coaches in town, at least the ones that I work with, I string all of them guys for free. That way they send or recommend their students to come to me. So some of the younger guys, I've actually started training them how to string so that they can start stringing their own students because I just can't keep up with them. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, like I said, I've got a real job. Yeah. And so I can only string some. About five at night to whenever, but then I got to get up and go to work at seven a.m. Yeah. So I don't want to be stringing until two, three o'clock every morning. Right? Yeah, you want to do other stuff. University on a good night for the university, I'll average probably ten rackets a night from them mm-hmm. about four days a week. Well, plus there's uh, the pickup and delivery. Two or three. So yeah. Don't travel out or whatever. Yeah, but, but you have pickup nice. and delivery. Yeah, but but you have to pick them up and deliver them, and I mean, there's time there, you know. It's yeah, all the stringing. Time. Yeah, so I, I could totally see it, but no, that's good that you're, and that actually brings, I mean, I, I guess we should probably cut this, uh, cut the speed here pretty soon. We've been, we've been going an hour already, so yeah. um, it's been, it's been kind of fun though, but I think you you said one thing on, um, when you emailed me initially that um, sometimes you feel like, um, you know, when you try to uh, help other stringers or other people to understand a little bit more about racket stringing or, or uh take your knowledge and try to, you know, help somebody get better at, at the trade. You get a lot, you get resistance from that sometimes. And I felt that in the well, past too, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to say when I try to share it, but in the past, when I was first learning and I would try to gather information from people, I've noticed a lot of resistance people, you know, I'd go to a club somewhere, like we'd travel with the daughter and somebody be stringing a racket. I'd go try to learn from them. They don't, you know, Oh no, no, no. You got to get away. You got to get away. You, know, you can't be over here. But so I had a lot of difficulty trying to gather information. So that's why I guess my philosophy is I share anything with anybody. I mean, anybody calls me up or sends me an email, they message me on uh, YouTube. They say, hey, where do you get this? How do you do this? That's why I have a, just a blank database that I ma- mail out to people. Hey, what do you use for a database? So here it is. So I can mm-hmm. I, I tell them. And uh, I think in my email, I told you, you know, once I started watching all the YouTube videos, there's some great videos. Yeah. But most of them are very, I guess, macro, I think is the word, mm-hmm. where they show you the whole process, but they don't break down the little bitty details. Well, why are you starting to straight under instead of over? Why are you starting over yeah. instead of under? Yeah. Why are yeah. you doing I mean, they don't break that down. So right. I've tried right. throughout my videos a little bit, at least, to yeah. explain that. Why, yeah. why I do this. And you're not going to get any better unless you take one thing and you just go, you know, you tell yourself like, okay, I'm going to work on improving in one little thing because one little yeah. thing leads to another little thing. Because honestly, in my own stringing, I always refuse. I'm not refuse, but you know how I would get to a tournament and you always rely on what you know the best. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody showing you a new method or showing you something new. And I'm like, oh, no, that's too much work. I'm going, I'm just going to rely on my own. But you never learn that way. You know, for me still, I push strings versus pulling the ma- the crosses. Mm-hmm. And I really, you know, I had many opportunities to learn really how to how to do it the other way where you pu- pu- um, you're pulling them versus uh, pushing them, right? The crosses, you know, when you're weaving. And so I still want to learn how, because when you're doing poly, it, it is much easier if you're pulling them um, many times than, 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 than pushing them with your fingers. Yeah, you're saying and I started out pulling. Really? And I yeah. Can- got to where I could push them, and I, I struggled pulling to do a pull weave. I have to do a push weave. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can kind of finagle them across when I pull, but for me, yeah. it's very uncomfortable now. <laughs> really? Yeah, so, you know, those kind of things, but if you just take something and just, you know, watch a video and learn a little bit and just uh, practice it a bunch, eventually, you know, it'll come, you know, you'll something that you can put in your arsenal. Um I guess I'll leave on the, the one thing I did want to um, also ask is like when I saw I watched one of your videos where you're stringing a racket and, you know, use a starting clamp like like I do as well, you know, just to start your your crosses. Right. And then after about three or four. Uh, 
weaves of uh, the, the crosses, then you'll go back and you'll um, secure the top portion of the crosses, right? And take off the starting clamp. Now, I've always been kind of um, trying to figure out, like I would always go back and pull that first cross one more time before I tie off. Um, but when I think about, well, now I'm adding extra tension because I pulled it, you know, I pulled it the opposite, the other way initially when I clamped the, 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 the crosses on there, right. On the two, on the two piece string. And then I would, you know, string a few. So in reality, that string's already been pulled, you know, tightened. And so if I tighten it one more time, you know, I've actually double tightened that string, you know, and I have seen some people that don't do it. They will just, you know, um, uh, use, you know, put the clamp, you know, the, the machine clamp on the string and then remove the starting clamp and then just tie the knot. But I feel like you're losing tension on that. So I, I like to pull it one more time um, before I, uh, you know, um, secure it. So and right. I noticed you did too. So, I mean, what's, was that just um, arbitrary that you were doing that or were, do you do that on purpose and do you do it consistently? Well, so the way I started it is I would get a starting clamp, I'd pull the front of the top string, and I'd clamp it, then I'd go down three or four, then I'd go back and pull a knot tension on the top string, then I'd tie it off. So that's how it always started. And I got into a debate on the tennis warehouse forums. We had a big debate one day about double pulling the top strings, where you'd clamp it off first, actually pulling the second string. And then when you tie the knot, you do the knot tension on the top string so that, that way you don't do the double pull. And I've mm -hmm. actually kind of converted over to doing that away. And I guess my thought process behind it is when I was clamping it and then pulling the knot tension, one, you should be getting the ball up there. That's, that's my philosophy. But two, once you've pulled it the first time, that string's going to relax a little bit as you're stringing through crosses and then when you pull the knot tension on it it's you're probably pulling close to what 20 if you're trying to pull 10 percent, you're probably cl pulling closer to 20 percent because yeah. it's relaxing. yeah so and so i don't know so I, I started doing it the other way where i pulled the second cross and then i just go back and pull the top cross the one time and because you know when you're pulling the second cross you don't do the friction around I would say, you know, you're not going to get full tension on that top cross. You're probably getting, what, maybe 50, right. 60 percent. Right. So, I don't know. So, I've kind yeah. of tradi uh, transitioned to that just so I'm not double pulling in it. And right. Make it, to be honest, yeah. it's a little bit faster because that's one string you're not pulling twice. Right. Um, you know, and I guess if you are just consistent in the method that you're using, either, either or, then ultimately it's not going to be a major factor. But the one thing you got to be careful is to have that top cross or the bottom cross be loose, you know, to the touch. Because, you know, players usually like when you, you know, give a, a freshly strung racket back to the player, many times they either, you know, will touch the outer main yeah, or, 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 or move the, the, you know, the crosses on the top or the bottom, right? To see kind of more, more on the bottom, you know, to see kind of feel, hmm, does this feel tight or did he not know how to not? you know, um, tie off his, his racket, because that's where many times you separate beginners from, you know, people who have a little bit more experience is that knot tie off, right? Because mm. you lose a lot, you could lose a lot of tension on that knot tie off. Oh, absolutely. You know? um, there's just, there's a science that really goes into it that a lot of people don't really see, you know, but you just, you just get yeah, that. And I guess I'm fortunate for strength at the university. I'm friendly with all the players. So I get to experiment a lot through them. So, you know, I can string one way, then I can change something up, and I'll give them the racket, and I'll talk to them, you know, the next day. Okay, so how'd that racket feel? You didn't need to notice a difference? Okay, then maybe I'll stick with that method. But if they say, well, you know, that felt kind of wonky, then I can go back or I can try something else. So I get to, I get to do that a lot. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Herb, you know, it's been fun talking. Um, hopefully, uh, I think, I think you know, the people out there really got hopefully some good information, and it was uh, – 
it was fun to kind of get to hear your story about, you know, what you do out there in Texas. And um, because usually I, I don't have a lot of um, experience at on, on the college level as far as the stringing, you know, just to hear a little bit here and there. But it sounds like you've created a whole market um, and niche for yourself that works you know, fine for the way that, you know, you want it to work. And, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, I, I think that's been really valuable and hopefully we can, uh, you know, keep, keep chatting and I'll, I'll watch your, your channel. Cause sometimes some of those little might, like you're saying, the micro elements of stringing, um, are those important ones that, that kind of can really help, uh, get that stringer to the next level. And you've got some great equipment there. And so, um, yeah, well, so I, I, you know, I'll just I hope with that. I'm sitting out here as proof that all these little home things, if you really want to be successful at it, you can be. And you don't have to travel, you don't have to do this, but you can be if you put the work into it. Yep. Yep, I totally agree. So yeah, so uh thanks. Um and uh I'm gonna go ahead and